Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Malini and today we are shifting the conversation around menstrual health and menstrual hygiene management from awareness to action. I'm excited to explore how improving menstrual health management practices in the workplace can empower women economically and we will do this with our incredible panelists Annabel, Arundhati and Bethany. Can you share your insights into some of the global movements in the menstrual health workplace policies such as period leaves, support during menopause, accommodations for menstrual disorders, etc. And of course, you've seen the journey over the last 25 years. So it would be lovely to see how these are being implemented currently and what is the thinking uh, in Africa about these policies. I think we've come a long way. As I have seen there's quite a bit of debate uh, globally, but again also at the national level. For example, Kenya has uh, formulated a menstrual hygiene policy that was in 2019. Um, and uh, basically it is looking more at just seeing how we can demystify this debate of menstrual hygiene because it is looking quite a bit into the issues of taboos and stigmatization that comes with menstrual hygiene and across the board not just actually in the workplace but generally when you look at it from the community level to the school that is associated with being a woman because then as a woman then you're supposed to look like a you know you're very clean and so if you stain your clothes then it is uh, you're not clean although it is still far from being realized but at least there is a bit of open discussion in regard to menstrual health. Uh, even though we don't say that, um, can I get, get a day off because I'm having an issue with my menstruation, actually you can say that I need a day off because I'm not feeling well. Uh, majority of women don't really say that it is because they're having menstruation, but they're able to get some days off especially if their menstruation is problematic. Even then, we still have a challenge in the sense that uh, if you miss office uh, or you don't go to the office for a couple of times or every month you look like you're not going to the office, then there is a challenge. Uh, and so they're going to associate you with someone who is not committed to your work. Thank you. Specifically, how these policies are being adopted in India and uh, what do you see the future? Uh, of these policies being uh, increasingly adopted in India. We are now looking at menstrual health more holistically as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of a disease or infirmities, kind of drawing from the WHO definition. And we're bringing this lens to look at menstrual health in terms of the menstrual cycle, so going beyond the days of bleeding. And the other shift, as also you alluded to, is that we're from menstrual hygiene management, which is focused on you know, access to products, awareness and toilet and water facilities that are required. We're looking at the spectrum of issues related to menstrual health and well-being across the life, uh, across the life course. So these are really, um, you know, an important direction, a very critical lens when we are looking at women and work and how does menstrual experiences um, across um, across the time that they are at work, how does that play out for them and what's required to enable women to participate as fully as they want to uh, in the workforce, be that the formal workforce or the informal workforce, organized or unorganized sectors. When we're looking at women in work, I want to break this down in a few ways as to what we're seeing happening a little bit globally, because this is it's also a very new issue. Um, we're primarily focused on adolescents and young people, and now we're beginning to look at an adults and adult women in the workforce. So, um, our thinking on this is still kind of being shaped globally and in India. Um, but I'm going to begin off with uh, um, with a kind of with the dominant narrative, which is menstrual hygiene management. And this is still extremely critical uh, and a very important basis for us to look at women in the workplace because whether a person who menstruates has period pain, has any disorder, has any significant discomfort or not, she or they are going to have a period. Uh, when they are at work, right? Globally, um, the push has been that ensure that we have gender responsive, female friendly toilet facilities uh, at the workplace. Um, so make sure that we have separate toilets for women, toilets which are safe, that are private, that are comfortable, that are clean, that are accessible, um, uh, with of course important criteria of safety woven in. 
and when we add the menstrual lens to this we are also looking for things like ensuring that a dustbin is present in the toilet stall or within that toilet complex uh, for disposal if any other kind of waste management solution may be provided feed products may be provided within the toilet complex uh, for people to use um we're also looking at certain things like you know like hooks or shelving so that people can place their feed products safely and and fairly cleanly as they're preparing to change um and you know so looking at it beyond uh, the provision of um toilets and water we also see that in some uh, there has been some discussion of uh, on the both the product front as well as the waste management front uh, in workspaces so for products while typically the ask has been to provide pads um or or, or tampons uh, there's even some folks who say that let's provide a basket of options so let's provide pads and tampons and menstrual cups or reusable pads so that people who menstruate can have a choice as to what they may want to use um with disposal while bar, uh, dustbins are um are the lowest hanging fruit that we can provide there are of course examples of companies providing you know specialized dustbins so those ones that provide some kind of deodorizing or sterilizing mechanism um so that the waste can be contained for longer periods of time and then collected and taken for downstream management and then um some companies may also install incinerators within the toilet complex so that the waste is handled on site as well there's also slow but a growing recognition that menstrual health needs extend beyond the immediate hygiene needs you know of having to change your product um regularly uh, when you are at work when some of the trends that we're seeing is greater recognition that um period disorders or menstrual disorders discomfort pain and these are debilitating conditions where it's accompanied by heavy bleeding longer duration bleeding and can really affect whether a person can even turn up for work maybe on day 1 of our period we may have pms that you know affect some mood our energy levels and ability to be at work and there are a few different ways in which we're seeing organizations or companies deal with this there may be a restroom with a bed um or or, or you know a comfy chair for women to just rest for a while um that if they are having symptoms which are bothersome and which um which they just they, they don't need to take a day off work or they are unable to take a day off work but um enable them to at least kind of decompress or figure out how they can um you know manage that symptom even though it's a temporary measure and that may be accompanied by providing some kind of pain medication etc at work the other thing is i mean and the most popular one is that we're seeing is the concept of period leave so offering employees period leave so that they can take the days that they are have significant discomfort pain or are dealing with these more severe conditions now when we look at india we still have to kind of understand how these uh symptoms and these conditions are affecting as women and as people who menstruate how is it affecting our ability to be at work be present at work and be able to contribute at work you know and 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 how does it affect us both mentally and physically so i think an example of how this has been done globally and what's also taken real shape in india is period leave and we know that period leave is not being implemented uniformly organizations universities are doing this in very different ways it could be optional it could be um something that uh, that may be incentivized or not in, or, or people who do not avail of period leave may be incentivized in some countries um some companies may provide um one day of period leave some may provide more than that some of them may provide uh, you know a work from home and again i think we need to understand what's really working best for female employees um uh, in terms of of period leave the third issue that we we're looking at globally and it's bringing it's making its way into india is that of uh, the menopause transition or what we call perimenopause and this condition can last or this transitional phase for women can last 5 to 10 year symptoms vary across the transitional phase um but symptoms also differ from person to person in india we're trying to look into the data of, of when women are hitting menopause but overarching we're seeing that women hit menopause at a much younger age in india than in high income countries so we're looking at early mid 40s the age at which women are rising up the the work ladder if you are in the formal workforce understanding what that means for women uh, in leadership positions looking at women in the informal workforce 
we actually don't know much at all as to how perimenopause is affecting them and their ability to be at work there are symptoms that can be particularly bothersome and very challenging to manage in a very public workplace setting so these are things that we're trying to kind of unpack the interconnectedness between mental health and menstrual health whether that's uh premenstrual symptoms whether that's premenstrual dysphoric disorder which is a more, far more severe mental health issue as well as of course um issues that we're dealing with when we're going through the perimenopausal phase we're still trying to unpack what this means at the workplace and what kind of interventions we can bring uh i was wondering if you could please share some details of the usaid funded action research that you led in partnership with athena economics on mhm in the workplace i know that while the overall objective was to determine if providing adequate mhm in the workplace contributes to improve business and social outcomes uh, including women's economic uh, empowerment could you just highlight uh, what the key findings and recommendations that emerged out of this study were so the work that we did in partnership with Athena and and also reaching out to stakeholders in both Nepal and Kenya was focused on understanding women's experiences of menstruation in the workplace and one key point to that is that as we dove into this work we realized that we wanted to change that definition just slightly and actually focus on women who work outside the home and the reason that we did that is because not all women have a workplace um sometimes they do they might also have variable places that they work a lot of women work a lot of jobs so we felt that by changing that to women who work outside the home that would be uh more inclusive of women's real experiences and actually bring in people who don't have a stable workplace um an example of this could be someone who does cleaning work but goes to a different location every single time but the primary motivation for the overall project was to understand these experiences of menstruation and how that feeds into economic experience our specific slice of that project was on measurement and indicators we used a conceptual model to try to understand well what do we need to measure well we need to measure experiences of individuals we need to measure experiences of the environment that they're in and we need to also measure experiences of the institutions and we also need to um really focused on their individual perceptions of each of those things and their experience One of the reasons that we did that and I think this is the a strength of the study um but also a potential limitation is that everything we measured was from women themselves. It's ideal like in schools to also measure what facilities exist in schools. But we intentionally did not want to limit ourselves to just one workplace or, you know, just one institution. So, in order to be able to embrace a variety of places where people worked, we needed to ask women themselves about and to reflect on their experiences of their workplace. So, everything is individual level. One of the important highlights I think is that we were um by design only talking with women in an urban space. So, we were talking with women who were working outside the home in an urban area. Um we did see some differences between Kenya and Nepal but one of the things that struck the partners um across the board was that the scores for or the data around um menstruation interfering with work for many did not seem to be as high or pronounced as expected. I think this can be interpreted in a few ways. One, it's possible that those engaged because they were working were in good jobs. This work took place shortly after or even in the context of COVID. So if people were working and engaged in work, they might have been lucky. So they might have already represented a different sample of women. The other thing is that I think it requires us to check what we think really bad is. 10% of women said that during their last menstruation they missed a day of work. Some people didn't think that was very high. I think that's pretty high. Um then we had um in terms of missing a partial day of work because of last menstruation whether having to go early come late leave in the middle that was 16% of women in Kenya and 10% in Nepal you know we don't need over 50% or 80% to have these issues be important that's a 
fairly sizable proportion of women that we're talking about. We also asked different questions about women's productivity um, and potential earnings and stresses related to, to menstruation as well. And so we have variable findings. And similarly, I would say that these don't necessarily shoot up to the over 50% level, but it does make us think and say, well, among these women who do have these experiences, we need to focus on them, figure out why they have these experiences, why they miss Merck, why they're missing out on earnings, um, and use that information for action. You're moving beyond policies, uh, as you rightly mentioned, that sometimes you may not have very formal, formally laid down rules and policies, but um, because of the awareness, uh, organizations are taking innovative approaches uh, to uh, support women. And what would be some of the innovative approaches or best practices by organizations in Africa that you have come across for improving menstrual health in different workplace settings? I mean, uh, and, and what are these organizations really doing to go beyond just awareness and take concrete actions to improve uh, menstrual health management at workplace? In quite a few cases, I have seen like in one of the organizations where we discussed and about menstrual hygiene and they said that, uh, well, sometimes we do keep uh, pads in the office. They have bins where you can be able to dispose your pads. Uh, and so unlike before where you had to really think about what do I do with my pad when I have used it and I have changed, and in most cases, uh, people used to wrap it and then you carry it, you have to know where to throw it. And majority of people said that, you know, we wrapped it and then you took it uh, with us, we can throw it outside, uh, either at home or wherever you needed to go and dispose it. And the reason why this is happening is that uh, they're trying to demystify, remove the taboos. I, I think one of the things that uh, we saw in Kenya is where a woman who is a senator went to the parliament with uh, had her white jeans uh, stained and uh, she was told to go out of the office and I think it brought out a national debate. So what we are seeing is that uh, there the, are the quite a number of national debates that are taking place when it comes to like people being, being mishandled because they stained their clothes or because they had uh, issues to do with menstruation. And uh, so basically you can see that there is a bit of openness you know, just breaking the silence, which I think is very, very critical. I was wondering if you would be able to share a little bit about, um, from a research angle, are you finding enough work being done to showcase the evidence on how these policies and interventions actually impact the economic outcomes for women? that too in various settings, not just in urban uh, corporate settings, but also in informal uh, workplace environments, because this kind of evidence can really help move the needle uh, on, uh, uh, you know, greater adoption of these uh, practices and policies and interventions. This issue of women and work and understanding their menstrual health at work is a, is a new area. And, and that's why we haven't seen enough evidence generated. We probably have a little more insight when we're looking at more formal work sites, but there's an absolute dearth of insights and evidence when we're looking at the vast variety of uh, informal workplace settings. We lack insights into women's experiences of uh, menstruation and their menstrual cycle at the workplace. But I also want to take a step back and you ask this, uh, what are the outcomes that we are really looking to uh, influence and shape here uh, for women and for their menstrual health? And I want us to look at it in, in three ways. One is for employers, what are the outcomes that matter? We do know that there is interest in reducing absenteeism at work because that's linked with productivity. Then we want greater productivity at work. We want our employees to be satisfied. So employee satisfaction is a driver for them. And for some organizations, recognition that they are a, a, a sensitive, a responsive or a gender um, uh, you know, equitable workplace is something that's important to them. Secondly, is from the employee's perspective. Some of the research suggests that employees, it matters to them that they feel supported at work, that they feel heard, that they can actually bring up the issue of period pain. Another outcome could be that 
I want to contribute to my potential and sometimes my period doesn't allow me to do that. There's research by Washpal that suggests reduced healthcare expenses is a is a critical factor, a critical outcome, um greater openness to discussing the issue at work. Uh and I think for women the kind of trends that we're seeing especially in low income low and middle income countries, India included, is that you know how are women being how are they able to be a part of the workforce uh, in general um and does um and and how can we therefore make uh workplaces more um conducive environments that to enable them to be productive members of the workforce and third is that also like us to look at this as you pointed out from the economy lens so um women's greater participation in the workforce undoubtedly brings huge economic benefits contributes to country's gdp um and therefore that becomes an important outcome we do have some evidence but it's it's simply not enough so it seems to have surfaced quite a few important gaps in knowledge so what could be some of the future research priorities uh in this space that you think uh we must absolutely start focusing on right that what this experience did is provided us with a lot of data <laughs> um but because the intention was to report on and to test measures um and to consider which ones would be good for um maybe advancing to be indicators for regular monitoring we only had the time space and resource support to test the measures and report out on how they performed So just the descriptive statistics that I was talking about. X percent of women experienced this. X percent of women indicated that they did or did not have a type of facility at the workplace. But we didn't have the space to do with this data which would be really informative is understand what how these data are linked. So what conditions and experiences lead to some of the outcomes that we're seeing? What determines them? and digging in even further who specifically um among those groups are there certain um physical characteristics related to age that determine these um specific outcomes is it certain job types that determine these outcomes whether or not someone has a more formal paid position or one that seems a little bit more informal for example and they have to you know work uh if they're working selling food um outside and they have to leverage public restrooms how does that vary um what about differences in their biology of menstruation we we looked at heavy menstrual bleeding um in this sample as well in terms of you know research opportunities there's an opportunity to do more data analysis in this to see what those links are if we can identify those links it can help us identify what needs to change and what we can do we are also I think that the the other point is this is just two locations and it's urban. It was a very specific time related to COVID. I think that we are not necessarily capturing enough women in diverse work formats uh with informal jobs. The other one is unfortunately sometimes in the field of gender, uh if there's one study people feel like the questions are answered. We're not done yet. Other areas need to be explored more. It's a really wonderful starting point, um but it's it's not enough. And then the other thing I would just add is that I think that there's great research that has been done by some colleagues like Julie Hennigan and what she did is um actually focus on a few specific workplaces and worked with and understood women's experiences in those places as well. So more work to that end could be explored beyond the spaces she explored which was healthcare settings, schools and markets. Women work in other settings, we need to know more about what those other settings are. We've got the Pediatric Positive Workplace which is a great initiative that was started uh, more than a year ago uh, by the by the by the Health Policy Project, Days for Girls, PSI and a few other partners and they've been kind of speaking to employers and employees and they've been, you know, hearing what those benefits to both groups are. Um and it goes beyond reduced absenteeism and greater productivity. It goes to employee satisfaction, being able to talk about the issue, feeling that the workplace is just more an open space where they can even ask for a period product if they need to. Can we really dig deep into whatever's happening across the world right now uh, in terms of workplace initiatives for menstrual health? What's working? Why? 
and how what are some of the challenges that need to be overcome i, I would place that as one important area of work the second is actually going down to understanding what are women's needs for menstrual health in the workplace and can we cover different categories of of female workers different across different types of work uh, that exist and to understand menstrual health across this and what those needs are and i still think that we have a lot to do in that space so again kind of drilling deeper into those there's been some interesting debate which which uh, you know we've been witnessing which is um does menstrual leave reinforce stigma and discrimination or whether it's fueling the pay gap or whether it's helping women be more productive and grow within the workplace i think we need uh, more research on that so for me if i was to think about the areas that require additional research i strongly feel that it would be very important for us to see uh all the upcoming of the different innovations and especially on the pads because we are coming up with pads that are reusable and everybody is actually getting into that market but it is not clear the extent to which we are uh checking the implications what would be the impact of uh reused pads knowing that uh majority of people who go for those are also people who who don't have adequate water to clean them up does it have any implication so you do want to check and see whether is it really the appropriate thing and should it actually be used by which category of people and then so so for me the the impacts of using uh, those reusable pads and especially for the low income areas where water is also a problem i think that would be a very interesting area to check so what standards are being followed and who is actually monitoring all that so i think that's what i would say that we need maybe to look into those two areas and determine the extent to which they are appropriate uh, for health but also for the environment do you see any evidence on how these various policies and interventions uh, have any impact on the economic outcomes for women uh but and in different settings like is it leading to uh, better productivity and better economic outcomes is it different between urban and rural areas between formal and informal workplace environments uh for vulnerable populations and then what are some of the further areas of research and evidence that are needed to to be able to measure and quantify the positive impacts particularly on economic outcomes for women okay i think one of the um economic impact for women is uh first is to note that uh, when we don't have access to adequate uh, sanitation it has a huge implication on particularly women because they're the ones who bear you know the burdens of looking for where sanitation is and i want to say that uh, not only is there an implication for women but i think even organizations and especially the workplaces because productivity can actually go down and that affects the productivity of the entire organization and the way it will perform even financially i think a good case is where in one of the institutions they said because they do not have a sanitation that is appropriate for a uh, women when they are menstruating uh this organization they said that uh, they then women then prefer to walk to a different facility which is almost like 5 minutes away and so what this means is that um the organization loses even in terms of time because then women have got to go out and look for a facility that is appropriate however it's also good to say that uh, when you lack a good sanitation facility um for women particularly who are casual workers it means that on the days they are menstruating they don't go to work and i remember when we had a discussion with some women who work as casual workers and they always say that uh, because their job involves a lot of standing and uh, a lot of um uh like movement so they become very drained when they go to work so on the days they are menstruating and especially the first and second days they opt not to go to work what does that mean that for the two days they are not going to have an income and so basically what you're saying is that there is inadequate infrastructure so you don't want to carry your 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 pad because you really don't want to take it to put it in your bag maybe you don't even have 
adequate space. But basically what it translates to is either a loss of a job or for the organization, it is productivity and therefore performance in bottom line. What do you think are some of the key indicators that can effectively capture the economic outcomes and economic empowerment gains from enhanced MHM practices? One of the first points is, you know, yes, I think because of even some of the statistics that I, I shared in the beginning with women missing a day of work in their last menstrual period, that adds up whether you're in an informal workplace or not. Um, if that was one day in your last period and you potentially, uh, at least one day at least, that's potentially 12 days a year that you didn't want to take off. Um, one is we need to consider how that personally affects the the life experiences of women. What is the impact on them and their in their economic potential? One of the reasons I think people care a lot about and policymakers might pay attention to this issue is is once it's aggregated up to a higher level of well, now that we see in our population this many people are missing and this is the amount of sort of kind of um, missed opportunity for economic gain in the workplace, that's when I think policy makers pay attention. Where I'm a little weary of that kind of information is only insofar as that we don't forget that women are important and their experiences are important for they themselves. Um, they're not just instruments for the national economy. So in terms of the indicators, um, one of the, you know, we looked at some of these gains and some of these absenteeisms or presenteeism, these, these earnings, you know, the other, the other um, economic related measures that we looked at are job satisfaction. Also looking at presenteeism, okay, you might be there, but are you able to do the work that you're supposed to do? A lot of jobs that women have across the world are measured by their productivity. But I do want to sort of couch and say, this is just the ideas that we tested. One of the things that we talked about with USAID and our partners is, this is a starting point. What did we miss? What else do we need to try and test? And let's get people together who work in this space and do a prioritization of what we think we should be measuring um, in terms of economic engagement. What's useful for pushing policymakers in terms of driving the economy and why that's important, because that's what's gonna influence them, as well as what's important just because women need to be supported in, in their space. Just to conclude this interview, you have mentioned so many areas that we still need to look at and work on and uh, research, build evidence and bring innovations in. But if we were to ask you that if you had an opportunity to work on something and dedicate the next few years towards it, what would be that uh, one area within the menstrual health, menstrual hygiene management space at workplace? I would look at uh, availing probably menstrual uh, material for uh, for the workers and providing uh, like medication for those who are menstruating and they're in the office because then we wouldn't have to have a downtime for women. So it's really just, you know, how do, how do we make it uh, easy for women who are menstruating to stay within the office, but also to be able to access the pads. If they access the pads, they access medication, they'll actually stay in the office. Um, in addition to doing this um, work with USAID around indicators for women who work outside the home, I've done work um, in collaboration with the WHO UNICEF um, Joint Monitoring Program for the past several years to identify gender specific priority indicators that can complement the indicators we have for sustainable development goal target 61 and 62. So basically the short of that means we've been measuring water access at the household level, we've been measuring sanitation access at the household level, but not individual experiences of that. So we have identified indicators that really identify some of those differences within the household and what women's experiences are, who's collecting water, what's the time use, who has access to water, is their perception of sanitation spaces that they're that they have that are clean safe um 
and also private. And this is very much related to work on menstruation and that intersection. If women are spending all their time collecting water, um, or if they're taking a lot of time caring for others in their household because of inadequate access to water san or sanitation or inability to perform hygiene, that can prevent them potentially from engaging in economic opportunities. With colleagues at World Vision, where we're really trying to understand the role that access to water specifically has on women's ability to engage in economic opportunity um, and intersections with that related to menstruation for sure. The other area um, most related to this is around indicators for adolescents related to menstruation. Are there institutions and areas not supportive? If they don't have the ability for resources, environments, and social support networks to learn young in a young age how to be agents of their own bodies, how does that then enable them to do so when they're older and in the workplace and to demand that they should have that? One that I'm, I'm very keen to understand, whether menstrual health initiatives, should they be standalone or should they be clubbed under you know, more broader initiatives for women's uh, participation at work or women's health initiatives more broadly. Should it fall within that broader umbrella of making workplaces just more gender responsive spaces and allowing women to be active participants um, in the workplace and bring their productive selves to work? Or should we look at it in silos? How do we shape that narrative of menstrual health in the workplace? Is it as narrow as only period leave or menstrual leave? Or is it just about toilets and products? Or is it much more? And I think all these research pieces can help us you know, create a much broader framework that then organizations, companies can pick and choose from as to what they want to incorporate within their policies. We certainly need research uh, on women in different kinds of categories of work, or different categories of workers. Um, what does it mean to be an agricultural daily wage laborer, a construction worker? One last kind of research idea is seeing a very interesting movement on women in leadership across the world, including in India. Is there a role that women leaders can play for pa paving that path for gender equitable uh, workspaces? The research and data that is being uh, generated right now in, uh, you know, limited, but it's still, there is considerable work that is going on in this space. Do you see that being leveraged to inform policies? and interventions to support better MHM? I think it's there. What I think is fantastic about this community is that in the time that I've been working on uh, menstrual health, and of course, you know, it's had many acronyms and changes over the time and just menstruation in general, it's a growing group of people with passion and, and um, dedication around this area. And so I think that alone has the ability to cause influence because it is not just women. And there are men who are champions um, and people across the board who are champions, who are doing this work. We're pushing up against those ceilings and people are doing fabulous work. I think one of the key things that we need to do though is translate that data um, and make it accessible um, and easy to access to those making decisions. Thank you so much, uh, Bethany, Annabelle, and Arunditi for joining this conversation and sharing your insights. We look forward to taking this conversation forward.